Tonight I have three questions prepared, and if there's time for those three questions, we'll look at all of them. If not, we'll stop at the first two. But the first question is, and it's a question that somebody actually asked. They said, if the water pipes broke and the baptistry was bone dry, would my salvation have to wait until the plumber showed up? If I were to die before then, would I go to hell? If obedience to water baptism is the means of forgiveness of sins, then I would. That's his question, and then that's kind of a statement or assumption he makes towards the end of that question. I want to make some observations about questions. First of all, I would call your attention to Matthew chapter 21, 12 through 17. I'm not going to go there and read it, but it's a passage you're familiar with because it's the cleansing of the temple. That occasion where Jesus goes in, overturns those tables, and runs out those money changers and those animals, and he declares that you've made my house a den of thieves. That did not make him popular among the Pharisees or the leading Sadducees. Then the following paragraph is Jesus curses the fig tree. Now I tell you those two instances because then we get to chapter 21, verses 23 through 27. I am going to read that. Here it says, And when he entered the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Now someone might think immediately there in those verses, he's teaching, he's standing up teaching. What gives you the authority to stand up and teach? But if they kind of thinking, you know, and you're looking in the context, overall context, you see two paragraphs up, there was the cleansing of the temple. Who gave you this authority? And by what authority do you do these things? Then in verse 24, Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. And notice his response. They ask him a question. And the way he responds is by asking them a question. He says, the baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? And if we say from men, we're afraid of the crowd, for they all hold John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you what authority I do these things. Now looking at that little story is interesting because you get to the conclusion he didn't answer them. But he really did answer them. He answered them with a question and asking that question, get this now, he really determined their sincerity. Did they really want to know? Were they interested in following Jesus? The reality is no. So Jesus answered a question with a question. Well, you know, I began this with a person ask a question. If the water pipes broke and the baptistry was bone dry, would my salvation have to wait until the plumber showed up? If I were to die before then, would I go to hell? If obedience to water baptism is the means of forgiveness of sins, then I would. Like I say, there's basically two questions and then a little statement or summary on his point. I want to answer that. But I want to answer it with a question. You see, this kind of the, 
the context of that person asking, he's not believing that baptism is necessary for salvation. He is actually believing baptism is at the point of faith and there's nothing else needed to be done to be saved. So now I want to ask this question. If a sinner was going to church to hear the gospel and because of what's happened in his life, he's going because he realizes I've messed my life up. I, I, I'm away from God and I know it. I want to get right with God. He comes with a heart prepared and ready to hear and then believe. But he dies on the way to the building or maybe this, maybe the preacher's car breaks down and the service is canceled. Or let's say he dies of a heart attack during the singing and doesn't hear the sermon. He never comes to the point to hear about Jesus, to believe about Jesus. But his heart was ready to hear the gospel. Would he be saved or would he be lost? You see, answering that question with a question is reasonable. Because I believe that person would, would answer, well, no. He's got to do what the Bible says. The Bible says to believe. And he's not yet come to that point of faith. Even if he was ready, even if he was willing, his heart was prepared. He didn't come to that point. You see, he's really kind of answered his question as he would answer my question. In the end, all any of us can do is to use the opportunities that come our way to preach the gospel, for us ourselves to obey the gospel and help others find the Lord. These what if scenarios, they don't change what the gospel says. These what if stories, they don't change what the Bible teaches. You know, in Mark 16, 16, Jesus there gave the Great Commission. He said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. There he taught the importance and the necessity of faith and baptism. You get to Acts 2.38, finding the Great Commission preached, and Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, or Holy Spirit. You see, there it's saying, the necessity of repentance and baptism, even telling us that baptism is for the forgiveness of sins, in order to have your sins forgiven. Go to Acts 20 to 16. There we find Ananias telling Saul, and now why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You know, wash what's already been cleaned. In other words, this washing was to be made clean. 1 Peter 3, 21, we find there, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. In the religious world, you have a lot of people making a little bitty change, changing the W in now to a T from now to not. But it doesn't say baptism does not save you. It says baptism now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body. In other words, it's not taking a physical bath. But as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
That's a sampling of what the Bible says about baptism when we see the Bible's clear on the necessity of baptism. All of the what ifs scenarios do not change what the New Testament teaches about baptism. Now observation one was, you can answer a question with a question, observation number two, that I can read and study God's word and you can read and study God's word. Each is responsible to obey God's word. But observation number two is, but at what point did God displace Jesus as judge on that last day and put me or you there? You know, I don't really like the way that first question, you see, was, was asked or phrased because it's, it's kind of like asking me as if I'm deciding who's to be saved. I don't, and you don't. We find in Acts 17, 31, because he has fixed a day on which he will, he will judge the world in righteousness. Now listen, by a man whom he hath ordained or appointed. And of this he has given assurance to us all by raising him from the dead. So God said, I'm going to judge by a man that I've appointed. By the way, this man... I've given assurance to you about this judgment because I've raised him from the dead. So in other words, we know who that man is. It's Jesus has been appointed the one to be the judge. 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day and not only to me but also to those who love his appearing. Here he's saying the Lord is the righteous judge. These three passages clear. Jesus is the one who's going to be judging. I'm not, you're not. We need to be ourselves reading and studying. We need to be obedient. We need to teach and preach what the gospel says. The Lord is the judge on that final day. We find Jesus saying, the one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge, the word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day, John 12, 48. Now observation number three. Good Bible answers will not always sway or persuade the one asking the questions. We, we would like to live in a world where we think, and if I give you the right answer, you'll accept it. Good and honest hearts, yes, ought to be accepting truth. We also live in a world where you can give the right answer and it not be accepted. Now, we can be thankful for those times like Acts 2.41. That was the day of Pentecost, the gospel had been preached. And in verse 41, then those that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there was added to them about 3,000 souls. They gladly received and they obeyed. But you know, there's some other stories that don't turn out so well. The story of a rich young ruler, you're familiar with that story about this young man, it turns out to be a man of means. He comes to Jesus, comes to the right source, he comes running, he comes with urgency. He comes asking the right question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So up to this point, we're thinking, all right, good man. And as you read through the story, you really have nothing to surmise but what he is sincere and a good man. But Jesus is able to look penetratingly into his heart and realizes what separates him from God. And he says, wait. Here's what you've got to do. Sell all that you have and give to the poor. Well, he asked the question. Nobody told him to ask the question. He went to Jesus seemingly sincere. He was a good man. But when he heard the answer, we read, disheartened by the saying, 
He went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Like I said, we'd like to think we give the right answer. And somebody's going to receive it. And if it's needing to be obeyed, they obey it. Not the rich young ruler. I'll tell you another story in Jesus' life. It, I'm going to read from John 11, beginning of verse 45. But I hope that you kind of, John 11, John 11, that's, that's when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. This, this is, if you talk about uh, one of the most, if not the most significant miracle that Jesus performed, you know, this is it. Well, I'm going to start at verse 45 reading. It says, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. And I think, how could you not? But verse 46, But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Tattletales. Verse 47, So the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. Are, did you hear that? They said, for this man performs many signs. In other words, these Pharisees, these chief priests, Pharisees on the council are recognizing Jesus is performing these signs. They're not contradicting it. They're not saying, no, it didn't happen. They say, for this man performs many signs. Why aren't they lined up listening to Jesus? Why aren't they obeying what Jesus had to say? Then it goes on. He says, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. One of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this because of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from, so from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. They heard Jesus. They acknowledged he's doing many signs. From that day on, they made plans to put him to death. No one's answer, even Jesus, not even a sign, not even raising Lazarus from the dead, would persuade these men So observation number three, even the right answer, even good answers, even explain well, will not always lead to someone acknowledging truth. A second question. The question is, if the church of Christ claims to worship God only as authorized by Scripture because they sing only and do not use instrumental music, then where do they get the authority to use hymnals, pitch pipes, pews, and indoor baptistries in their worship services? If the answer is that they are aged to worship, where does the Bible allow for that? Where is your required authorization? A pitch pipe can be an aid to worship for the song service, then why can't a piano be an aid to worship for those who may need more help in singing? And that, that, that's a whole lot, and actually several questions within a question. Um, I'd like to give an illustration and begin to make my point. I'm assuming that the person who would ask this question does believe in the observance of the Lord's Supper. The scriptures specify, um, as we see the example of Jesus with his disciples, it would be the unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. The unleavened bread representing the body of Jesus, 
the fruit of the vine representing his blood. Would it be acceptable, would it be acceptable to substitute or maybe to have in addition to the bread, Oreo cookies? I like Oreo cookies. Tish could tell you I like Oreo cookies and one thing I like about it, she doesn't like them so I get to eat them all. But, okay, you might like sun chips or Lay's potato chips, you kind of get where I'm going. Would it be all right to take the fruit of the vine? And I want to tell you what goes with Oreos is milk. Good old fashioned milk. Whether you drink skim 1%, 2% or whole milk. Milk goes with Oreo cookies. So, But you might rather have Pepsi. Or you might rather have Coca-Cola. Is it okay to make the substitutions or maybe to add those things in? Well, I think the answer generally, most would say, well, no, because the scriptures specify the bread and the grape juice. And we see and understand this precedent. As you get to the last page of the text in your Bible, Revelation 22, 18 and 19, find that John writes, I want everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to them the plagues that are in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share out of the tree of life and out of the holy city, which are described in this book. In other words, he's saying don't add to, don't take from. Now this was a principle that goes all throughout scripture. It began in Deuteronomy chapter four, verse two. You shall not add, don't add to the word that I command you, nor take from it. Don't add to, don't take from. And then he gave the reason that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. You add to, you take from, you change, and what you're keeping is not the commandment of the Lord then. Maybe what you like, what you want, what you enjoy, but it's not the commandment of the Lord at that point. So we do not change the unleavened bread. We do not change the fruit of the vine, that grape juice, because we see that's what Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper with. Now, does God say anything about how we secure this fruit, this, this unleavened bread? Do, do, we, do we find there's any precedent on we've got to go to the store or buy it or someone can bake it? Is there any precedent on it's got to be baked fresh, you know, last night. Or it was baked two weeks ago, it's been in the freezer, it was brought out. Is there any precedent about this fruit of the vine that we, we buy it or we got to grow our own grapes? Oh, by the way, if it's grow your own grapes and stomp them like, you remember I Love Lucy, remember that episode? We'd kind of be thinking, no, go buy it, don't stomp them with your feet. Um, you know, somebody might say, well, I got confused. I went to the store and I found this fruit of the vine and here were these Concord grapes and here were these red grapes. Which, which one? You see where I'm going with this? While it's very specific, it's fruit of the vine. Where it's very specific, it's the juice of the grapes. There are some things that are left to the discretion and judgment of man. And we could recognize then the comparison somewhat of that with what the scriptures say about singing. You see, the scriptures plainly instruct us to sing. Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16, Hebrews 2, 12, James 5, 13, and we'll say, and etc. In the New Testament, with the music in the church, we're finding singing. And see, that's what we're trying to do. Nothing more, nothing less. Somebody says, wait a minute. Say, you used a pitch pipe to get the pitch, or you used song books, or you used a PowerPoint projector. None of these things changed or altered the fact that we sing and we only sing. Just like how we procure, if you would, the bread or the fruit of the vine. 
has not changed that it's the bread and the fruit of the vine. How we procure, if you would, the pitch. Say so somebody has a pitch pipe or somebody has a, a tuning fork or someone, they just kind of remember, you know, and they just start it from memory. That doesn't change that it's singing and singing only. We have a songbook that does aid us in our singing. Difficult for us to sing, and especially sing more than very, very few songs, and they all got to be from memory, if we didn't have either a songbook or, or the PowerPoint. But guess what? That, once again, that's not changed a bit. That's not altered the kind of music that God has said we should have. It is still simply simply and only singing. And I know sometimes people might say, why be so picky? If we're going to do our best to do what God says do, remember now, we don't want to add to, we don't want to take from, we want to keep the commandments of the Lord. That's why we don't change this up here. That's why we don't change the music that we find in the New Testament that was in the church, that it was singing. I've got a third question. We don't have time for it. But I hope that considering these things, and they're, they're very basic, but I hope that we would be a little better prepared in answering someone who might ask these questions. And I would hope, I would hope if they're asked, they're asked out of a sincere heart with a true desire for knowing what is God's truth in the Bible. And I would pray that that person who you are discussing this would gladly receive the word like you find in Acts 2, verse 41. As we close, once again, we offer that invitation. If you need to respond with faith, you've repented of your sins, you wish now to confess that faith and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, or if there's need for prayer, we'd be glad to take this time now and pray for you. If you need to come, please come as we stand.